Hello everyone, today we're going to take a look at a Lauren Southern video entitled What Every Girl Needs to Hear, which features Lauren speaking into a camera, saying things that she apparently thinks every girl needs to hear. So I guess you should all go and watch that video first then. Well, the ones of you who haven't seen it already anyway, some of you will have come to this video directly from that one, probably via the suggested video thing YouTube has, so welcome to all of you, nice to meet you everyone else, off you go. The link is in the description below. It's only 12 minutes long, or 6 if you click on that little cog in the bottom right and speed her up two times. And welcome back. So then, uh, what do we think about this video? What was Lauren trying to argue? What points was she making? Well, marriage good, sex bad, basically, when you boil it down. Your standard conservative religious abstinence argument just delivered in a vlogger style. And at first glance, it appears to be the sort of video that I personally find it rather difficult to argue against. You know, how can you respond to someone simply speaking their subjective opinions into a webcam? You know, just say your equally subjective counter opinions, I guess. And I mean, I could do that. Let's do that, in fact, for a little bit, uh, just as an example. So this is how that would go. Uh, I'd show a statement of Lauren's, like this one. A stable marriage and children are statistically one of the highest predictors of happiness in a woman's life. And then I'd say, ah, did you notice her thumb was on the scale there? She said, a stable marriage is a predictor of happiness. That's biasing the results there, because of course a lot of marriages are unstable, a lot of marriages make people unhappy. But if we just ignore those, you know, add that stable qualifier, suddenly marriages are a much better predictor of happiness. It's very tricksy there. Another statement of Lauren's is, women love strength and resources, men value youth and fertility. Of course, the problem here is that if this were the inescapable biological certainty that Lauren makes it out to be, her video wouldn't need to exist. You know, if people really did seek out partners according to these values, then for Lauren there wouldn't be a problem, would there? You know, what every girl needed to hear would be nothing, wouldn't it? Because they could just follow their hardwired biological impulses. No, Lauren's problem is that people aren't acting according to these values. This is simply how Lauren wants people to act. Lauren has an idea of what people are supposed to be like, but they keep acting differently. Which means that there must therefore be some nefarious liberal plot to corrupt people into acting counter to biology you know, rather than the simpler answer, which is that she's just wrong. Another quote of Lauren's is, You don't want to be competing with 20-year-old girls for 30-year-old guys when you hit the age of 30, because you won't win. Another subjective opinion, and my equally subjective counter is that I'm a 30-year-old guy, and I, for one, would much rather go out with someone around my own age than someone a decade younger than me you know, chances are we'd have a lot more in common, and in general this appears to be how most other people are. 538.com reports that data from the United States Current Population Survey shows that the average age difference for a heterosexual couple in the United States is only 2.3 years, which is not quite so dramatic as the 10 years in Lauren's example. I guess you don't want to be competing with 28-year-old girls when you hit the age of 30, wasn't quite as catchy. And then I'd just carry on like that, really, uh, showing something Lauren said, and then saying the opposite thing. I could point out that she never once mentions LGBT people. You know, the existence of gay couples, for instance, really throws a wrench into her argument there. You know, maybe those 20-year-old girls don't want to be competing for guys at all, Lauren. Maybe some guys would be more than happy to get married, but they can't because they're not allowed to marry their boyfriends. You know, what would Lauren say to those people? And then I'd wrap it up by saying all people are different. Uh, get married and or have kids if you want. If you don't, don't. That's cool too. You know, different things make different people happy. Farewell, folks. And it'd be all right, that video. You know, it wouldn't be terrible, would it? Uh, but I want to do something a little different today. You see, what I'm mostly interested in here is this particular quote from Lauren. If you want to dig into the research surrounding all of this, I've put all the sources in the description. And if we take a look, we see a section in her video description titled Links to Studies, followed by 10 links. And make your bets now, folks. Uh, how many of these links would you guess 
actually link to studies? Hmm. We shall see. So let's go through these sources now and take a peek at where Lauren got her ideas from. So first up is this link to a WordPress blog with sections titled such as Ugly Feminists, written by a happily married man living with his sexy wife and their two wonderful kids in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Uh, this is an article titled More Grim News for Carousellers Hoping to Jump at the Last Minute, in which the author with the sexy wife has used US census data to make some charts showing that the average age of unmarried women has been going up over the decades. You know, people who are getting married are getting married later, generally. Now, so what, you might think? You know, what does that have to do with Lauren's points about happiness and fulfillment and all that? You know, there's no data here that goes into how happy these women are or anything like that. You know, on average, women who are getting married are older. That's all these charts say. Any negative implications here are guesswork based on the assumption that these women want to get married but can't. You know, for a counter-assumption, we could say maybe, increasingly, People just don't view marriage as that important anymore. And so fewer people are making marriage a priority in their lives. You know, what does the author of this article have to say about that? And I quote, The nonchalance by women towards marriage has been misinterpreted by many as a lack of interest in marriage. But I believe that it is reflective of an assumption that marriage will be theirs for the taking. So what's the Russian? Oh, well, you know, he believes it. So there we go. Why does he believe it? I don't know. So that's our first study there. Uh, some guy with a blog believes something. Off to a good start. Uh, let's move on and look at the next link. So this link goes to a website titled Statistic Brain, and this post is Female Infidelity Statistics. There they are there, all the statistics. Uh, so which study did these statistics come from? Well, if we scroll down a little, we can see that the source is the Statistic Brain Research Institute, and the content author is Statistic Brain, which is this website. No study is linked, no actual author is listed. A website just typed some numbers and then cited themselves as the source. Now, not to attack Statistic Brain or anything here, they appear to be just some stat posting outfit. If you want a list of countries by amount of cheese eaten in pounds per capita, they've got you covered. You know, maybe. But they're unconvincing as a source that's supposed to inform opinions about the fundamentals of human nature. Uh, apologies to Statistic Brain here, but this isn't a study. It's some numbers on a website. I'm not even saying they're wrong numbers necessarily. They might be right. Uh, but there's no way to check. You know, how many people were surveyed? How were they contacted? How old were they? Where do they live? I don't know. You know, did Statistic Brain just make all these numbers up? Again, I don't know, and nor do you, and nor does Lauren. But there it is anyway in her list of studies. Uh, so let's look at the next study, which is this link. And it's a very interesting study, this one, as it appears to be laid out like a Wikipedia page and also is somehow hosted by Wikipedia on their servers. I'm not sure how Lauren managed to pull that off. So then, uh, joking aside, this is the Wikipedia page for J.D. Unwin. And if you don't know who that is, I would encourage you to watch my video titled Do Women Destroy Civilizations? A Response to Black Pigeon Speaks who is another YouTube video maker who pretended to have understood the works of J.D. Unwin. Uh, I won't subject you to all that again here. I'll just link that video in the description. Uh, what I will say here, though, is that this link, it's not a study, is it, Lauren? I mean, I hope you didn't do that in college if you went. You know, if you just cite Wikipedia in an essay, they shout at you. So that's three studies down, seven to go. Now, five of these remaining seven are links to different pages of the blog The Social Pathologist hosted on Blogspot, so let's take a look at each of those. First up is this article, Sexual Partner Divorce Risk, posted by The Social Pathologist. This article is not a study, however, it is at least talking about a study, so that is a significant step up there. 
The paper the article is talking about is Premarital Sex, Premarital Cohabitation and the Risk of Subsequent Marital Dissolution Among Women by J. Teachman. How's that for nominative determinism there? Now, if we click this link in the article, it goes nowhere. The study's gone. However, it is on JSTOR, so I purchased access to it. Right then, we're going to read this article and this study and see what they say. And I'll quote from the article first. Cohabitation, that is, living together before marriage, has been shown to increase the risk of subsequent divorce of a couple. So that's the first claim in this blogspot post. And now let's head over to the study and see what that has to say. Using nationally representative data from the 1995 National Survey of Family Growth, I estimate the association between intimate premarital relationships, premarital sex and premarital cohabitation, and subsequent marital dissolution. I extend previous research by considering relationship histories pertaining to both premarital sex and premarital cohabitation. I find that premarital sex or premarital cohabitation that is limited to a woman's husband is not associated with an elevated risk of marital disruption, end quote. So, uh -huh. Cohabitation before marriage has been shown to increase the risk of subsequent divorce of a couple was the claim on the social pathologist, but the study they cite claims the opposite in the first three sentences. So what's going on there? Well, what Teachman's study actually found is that cohabitation before marriage is not indicative of a divorce risk to the couple involved, but previous cohabitations with different people are. So if you're a woman who has been in several long-term relationships where you lived with someone else, you're more likely to later be divorced if you get married than someone who has only lived with their husband prior to marriage. So that's the correlation there, uh, but what's the cause? You know, is there something about living with multiple different partners that causes one to be more likely to divorce once married? Or is the data simply selective? For instance, very conservative people who take marriage more seriously than others would be both less likely to cohabitate before marriage and less likely to divorce once married. And conversely, people with a more liberal attitude to dating and relationships would be more likely to cohabitate before marriage and also more likely to divorce once married. To quote Teachman's study here, Unfortunately, this study does not provide any information that allows us to better determine whether the effect of having multiple premarital relationships is based on differences on pre-existing characteristics that are tied to the risk of divorce, or whether having multiple relationships generates environments where relationship skills or attitudes and values about the permanency of marriage are somehow altered. It remains the task of subsequent research to consider these alternatives more fully. So there we go. Uh, Teachman just notes the correlation. The causation was outside the bounds of his study, and he recommends further research before any conclusions can be drawn there. So then, back to Blogspot. Uh, let's read a little more of this article. Many investigators have felt that the practice of cohabitation is selective for people who don't value marriage highly, and hence are more likely to divorce when stress is put on the marriage. In essence, it was thought that cohabitors, more liberal values, placed them at higher risk of divorce. An editorial note here. That's true. That's the true thing. The social pathologist then introduces the study we've just read and posts a part of Teachman's conclusion before typing, Executive summary, it's not the liberal values, it's the number of partners that matter. Now, I'm sorry, social pathologist, but you misread that study. It doesn't say anything about liberal values in there. In fact, in a section titled Limitations, Teachman writes, the data contain no information about relationship skills or attitudes, values, or beliefs that can be used to distinguish between groups of women. And indeed, if we look at the variables used in the analysis, there is nothing in there about personal values or beliefs pertaining to relationships. So when the social pathologist says it's not the liberal values, it's the number of partners, that's a leap of logic. It's nothing better than a guess. You know, that wasn't what the cited paper was about. It's also a contradiction, because of course, someone's liberal values, or lack thereof, may very well influence the number of partners they have, if you follow. Which would make it about the values, ultimately. 
I mean, one could argue that having multiple serious relationships could change one's attitude to relationships in some way that could make divorce a greater possibility. And indeed, another study we'll read in a little while leans towards that conclusion. However, we can still make the case that people with more liberal values to relationships are more likely to enter into multiple serious relationships in the first place. So one's values would still be important there. It's complicated, basically. Uh, and this quote is a drastic oversimplification. Uh, so for this link, then, someone on Blogspot misread a study. I will point out here, though, that this article also mentions two noteworthy things, uh, the National Survey of Family Growth 1995 and the Heritage Foundation study. And we'll be hearing a lot more about both of those things going forward, uh, starting right now with the second social pathologist link, which is titled 2002 Male and Female Statistical Data, and I quote, I've managed to crunch the numbers from both the Male and Female National Survey of Family Growth. Method. First, my approach to analysis was Catholic, in that you're only allowed to get married once. Remarriages count as a fail. Uh, then there's a bunch of other rubbish, and eventually they get to the point of their article, uh, this graph they came up with. Number of lifetime sexual partners versus percent ever married who are not divorced. And reminder, if you're in your second marriage, you count as divorced in this graph. So, for example, if you were married for 18 months in your 20s, say, and then got a divorce, then remarried and have been married for 40 years steady since then, you count as divorced here. Your four-decade marriage would count for less in this graph than a newlywed couple who've been together for eight weeks. So, this graph is nonsense clearly. Uh, besides the bizarre only the first marriage counts rule, uh, this says number of lifetime sexual partners, not number of premarital sexual partners. And why is that important? Well, divorcees don't drop off the planet once they get divorced, do they? They keep entering into relationships and having sex. So if you get divorced and then have sex with, say, five people in the next few years, uh, your post-marital relationships are here being counted as a divorce risk for a marriage which is already over. You know, what a Gordian knot that is. So all that, and of course, this data is self-reported, and people tend to misrepresent their number of sexual partners when asked. Uh, men aim high, and women aim low, typically. The only other thing to say about this graph is, uh, to return to Lauren Southern for a moment, when she says a woman with just one previous sexual partner is an equivalent divorce risk to a man with 19, I think she got that from here, because one previous would be the two column here, and 19 previous partners would be the 20 column, so that's 57% and 54%, which is roughly equivalent. I couldn't find this claim anywhere else in these sources, so my best guess is that she got it from this completely ridiculous graph. Anyway, on to the next link. Uh, this blog post is titled The Virgin Bride, and is talking about a study from the Journal of Marriage and the Family by Joan R. Kahn and Catherine A. London, entitled Premarital Sex and the Risk of Divorce, which examines the relationship between premarital sexual activity and the long-term risk of divorce among US women married between 1965 and 1985. 1965, so quite a while ago there. Now, obviously, attitudes towards sex and marriage have changed rather a lot since the 1960s. Uh, so to see this source in Lauren Southern's video in 2017, with her doing her kids these days routine, is a bit odd. Women getting married in 1965 would have been growing up in the 40s and 50s, and are we really supposed to be able to trust self-reported data here, given the vastly different social stigmas towards premarital sex among people who grew up in that time period? I don't know. Anyway, uh, let's move on and quote a little of the study's findings here. We interpret the results of our analysis to mean that women who continue to hold traditional attitudes about marriage are less likely than other women to consider both premarital sex and divorce as acceptable options for themselves. It's likely that people who feel constrained by traditional expectations early in life will maintain this orientation throughout their lives, 
predisposing them to wait until marriage to begin sexual activity and to reject divorce as an option if they should become unhappy with their marriage. And it goes on. So different sorts of people raised in different environments with different values are acting differently with regards to relationships. That's what the authors of the study are saying is the likely thing here. Uh, the social pathologist doesn't care about all that rubbish, of course. To them, the number of someone's sexual partners is all that matters. They'll strip the data out of the studies in order to make graphs, as they've done for this study, which measures divorce probabilities of virgins with non virgins whatever they are. Uh, but as for the interpretations of the authors of the studies, the social pathologist seemingly isn't interested. And there needs to be a word for appealing to authority while rejecting the findings of that authority. You know, look at this very academic graph I made. It's sourced. It's using real data from a real academic study written by university professors who I think are wrong. And there's kind of a weird relationship going on there, you know. I believe the university professors were on point with their data collection and methodology and calculations, but when it comes to their interpretations of their study, well, I've got a blog, and I believe they're wrong. Anyway, the next social pathologist link is a guest post by a user named Intrepid. Now, this post is examining National Survey of Family Growth Data, the same National Survey of Family Growth Data as in the Heritage Foundation study. So there's those two things again. Now, we'll be getting to that study fairly soon, so I won't say too much about this post except for one thing that I can't help mentioning. In her video, Lauren Southern states that statistically, every man or woman sleeps with past one adds to the chances her marriage will later end in divorce. Now, this statement is not true. And this particular post, which is in Lauren's sources for some reason, explains why. Uh, so let's take a look at Intrepid's charts. So chart two, which is titled, Women who have more non-marital partners are more likely to have a first marriage ending in divorce. And that's what it shows. The more non-marital partners a woman has had, the likelier her first marriage ends in divorce. But we've seen this trick before. This is non-marital partners, not pre-marital partners. This data is being distorted by including the post-marital sexual relationships of divorcees. So what happens if we look at the same data, but instead consider the number of pre-marital partners instead of the number of non-marital partners? Well, as you can see, it tells a very different story. In this chart, women who have had five to nine premarital sexual partners are less likely to divorce once married than people who have only had two. And to quote Intrepid here, my own hypothesis is that a higher partner count, up to five to nine or so partners, is correlated with age and maturity in dating experience. Older women and women with more dating experience are more likely to have learned which personal qualities will work best for them in a marriage partner. As a result, such women choose more wisely and tend to experience lower divorce rates. So then, do you see what's wrong with Lauren Southern's statement? She fell for the non-marital slash pre-marital switcheroo and got her tenses wrong. Every man a woman sleeps with past one adds to the chance her marriage will later end in divorce. This claim is completely contradicted by one of her own sources. So then, on to the last blogspot link, uh, this one titled More Promiscuity Data, and again written by the social pathologist. This blog post is concerned with yet another study, uh, this one titled Adolescent Sexuality and the Risk of Marital Dissolution, authored by Anthony Paik for the Journal of Marriage and Family, and let's read a little of that. This research investigates whether first sexual intercourse during adolescence is associated with an increased risk of first marriage dissolution and tests whether the results are consistent with causal or selection explanations. Drawing on a sample of 3,793 ever married women from the 2002 National Survey of Family Growth, this study estimated event history models of first marriage dissolution. Results indicated that wanted sexual debut in later adolescence does not directly increase the risk of marital dissolution, but is linked indirectly 
as a result of subsequent premarital sexual outcomes. Sexual debut that is not completely wanted, or that occurs before age 16, is associated with increased risk of marital dissolution. The results suggest that the timing and context of adolescent sexual debut have important implications for marital stability. So, similar to what we've seen thus far in the other papers, however, with an important distinction here. This paper considers whether the adolescent sexual activity was wanted or unwanted, and that's something we haven't seen so far. It's an important point, because of course, sadly, sexual activity isn't always a choice. Someone could be taken advantage of, pressured, or forced into sex, and it's not hard to think of negative effects upon their later relationships that might occur as a result of that. Uh, the selectivity argument doesn't apply here, of course, as the author points out. The conclusion to the paper reads, Adolescent sexual debut that is not completely wanted is both directly and indirectly linked to marital dissolution. Because these decisions are not completely voluntary, a choice framework does not apply, which highlights the need for greater attention to the consequences of unwanted sexual experiences among girls. Now, we need to be careful when handling this particular data set. For instance, for an example of what you shouldn't do, you shouldn't title a blog post about the data more promiscuity data. You also shouldn't refer to the field of study as the science of slutology. I mean, you shouldn't do that anyway, but especially not when you're talking about adolescents, some of whom were sexually assaulted. You also shouldn't wonder if promiscuity is a mechanism of desoulment, as in, they've lost their souls as a result of the unwanted, remember, sexual experiences. You know, what sort of vile, horrible person would say something like that? Anyway, uh, that's kind of an odd word we just saw there, desoulment. Now, if you remember, Lauren Southern mentions desoulment in her video. She says, the path of promiscuity and desoulment around eight and a half minutes in. A phrasing which is very close to this blog post here, so I'm just going to assume that this is where she got it from. Now, we'll leave the social pathologist there for now, but I will note the final paragraph of that last post starts out with this sentence. I know that correlation is not causation, but... which... wow. I mean, they should make that the new title of their blog, I think. So that's eight studies down, two studies to go. Now, there's a reason that none of the links so far have been to actual studies. And it's because the actual studies keep saying awkward things like this is inconclusive, and this needs further research, and this correlates but we don't know the cause, and things like that, which would be a bit embarrassing for Lauren. So she has to link instead to religious conservative blog post reinterpretations of the studies, blog posts that call adolescent women sluts who've lost their souls. It's kind of pathetic really, isn't it? Anyway, on to the next link, which is a Stefan Molyneux video. Oh my god. Uh, this video is titled The Truth About Sex, Facts You Won't Believe Are True, which, yeah, no shit. So the majority of this video is Stefan reposting a bunch of graphs from the top link in his source list, which is also the last remaining link in Lauren's source list, the harmful effects of early sexual activity and multiple sexual partners among women, a book of charts from the Heritage Foundation. So here it is, finally. We've been hearing about this for a while. So who are the Heritage Foundation? Well, from their website, the mission of the Heritage Foundation is to formulate and promote conservative public policies based on the principles of free enterprise, limited government, etc. And it's nice when places just admit they have a bias up front, you know. So the Heritage Foundation is a conservative think tank which, by the way, promotes abstinence-only sex education. And there are many articles advocating abstinence on their website, such as this one, Teenage Sexual Abstinence and Academic Achievement, which was written by Kirk Johnson and Robert Rector who are two of the listed authors of the Harmful Effects of Early Sexual Activity study. So what is in this study, then? Well, it's just a lot of graphs, really, uh, some of which we've seen already. Here's them pulling the non-marital slash premarital trick, and here's that same graph in Stefan's video. 
And there's another trick in this particular graph, actually. It's to do with the Heritage Foundation's definition of a stable marriage, which they define as a couple being married for at least five years. Now, the average length of a first marriage that ends in divorce in the United States is eight years. So a lot of these so-called stable marriages ain't. You know, why did the Heritage Foundation pick five years to define a stable marriage when that's below the national average? Well, I don't know. I suppose five is a nice round number, isn't it? So the air quotes mistake the Heritage Foundation makes over and over again in this study is the by now very familiar correlation slash causation misunderstanding. For example, below this graph, which is titled Delay in Sexual Activity is Linked to Lower Levels of Child and Maternal Poverty, the Heritage Foundation writes, Early sexual activity is linked to higher levels of child and maternal poverty. Now, the problem here is that linked to doesn't mean causes. And this is the most basic type of logical misunderstanding. You know, every time the streets are wet outside, it's raining. Wet streets are linked to rain. So therefore, the wet streets must be causing the rain. Early sexual activity is linked to poverty. But of course, none of the brain geniuses who wrote this paper bothered to consider the reverse, that poverty could be causing higher levels of early sexual activity. For example, kids in poverty are less likely to live in a stable home, less likely to have supportive parents or guardians who can provide guidance for and supervise them. You know, maybe the poverty is the problem. Of course, the Heritage Foundation will respond by saying, hey, we never said sexual activity was the cause of poverty, we just said it was linked to it. To which I would respond, but you put it in a paper entitled The Harmful Effects of Early Sexual Activity. You know, their attempts to come across as academically neutral didn't extend to titling their paper. They gave away their bias in the first sentence. And they make this mistake over and over. Delay in sexual activity is linked to greater happiness. Earlier onset of sexual activity is linked to higher turnover rates among sexual partners, but these are just correlations. The cause remains unproven here. This study is a biased hack job. They took the National Survey of Family Growth data and rooted around in it looking for particular correlations in order to push an abstinence-only agenda. Now, speaking of that National Survey of Family Growth data, it's all available on the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention website, and I can't help but notice that the National Survey of Family Growth questionnaires included questions about sex education. For example, the Cycle 6 questionnaire from 2002 specifically asks about abstinence education, and one can imagine a study which uses this data to measure the effects of abstinence education versus the effects of a comprehensive sex education. It might be titled Abstinence Only and Comprehensive Sex Education and the Initiation of Sexual Activity in Teen Pregnancy, and it might find that adolescents who receive comprehensive sex education were significantly less likely to report teen pregnancy than those who received no formal sex education, whereas there was no significant effect of abstinence-only education. Abstinence-only education did not reduce the likelihood of engaging in vaginal intercourse, but comprehensive sex education was marginally associated with a lower likelihood of reporting having engaged in vaginal intercourse. Teaching about contraception was not associated with increased risk of adolescent sexual activity. Adolescents who received comprehensive sex education had a lower risk of pregnancy than adolescents who received abstinence only or no sex education. Imagine if such a study existed. I wonder what the Heritage Foundation would think about the same source they're attempting to use to push an abstinence only agenda, instead being used to prove abstinence only education is a waste of time. Now one last point I'd like to make about this Heritage Foundation study is that it examines data prior to 1995, and it's the main source in Lauren's video which she opens with a reality these days is being twisted speech. Now not to get too personal or anything, but Lauren Southern was born in 1995, after this data was collected. She has no idea what she's talking about on a personal level, you know, she's using sources from before she was born. 
She's just repeating the opinions of old, crusty white guys from places like the Heritage Foundation, and that's probably why her references to popular culture are so outdated too. You know, Cosmo Magazine and Sex and the City. I mean, that stopped airing over a decade ago, Lauren. Now, I bring up Lauren using old data here to mention that there is newer data available. Uh, the National Survey of Family Growth has kept going. They have up-to-date statistics and studies freely available on their website. So why are Lauren's sources so rubbish? I'm forced to wonder. To recap, there's a bunch of blogspot posts by a conservative Christian who doesn't understand how to read studies properly, an unsourced listicle, the Wikipedia page of an author who died in 1936 and isn't even mentioned, a Stefan Molyneux video, and a conservative think tank's abstinence propaganda. Including this list of sources was a mistake. Obviously. Lauren claims that her video isn't a bunch of weirdo religious propaganda, but looking at the sources, we can see... Yes, it is. Lauren Southern is repeating the same tired old debunked conservative talking points that we've all heard a thousand times. It's an attempt to sell conservatism to young people, and of course, because conservatism usually screws over young people, she has to lie. Now, I'll end here with a plea to any young person who was directed to this video after watching Lauren's and somehow has managed to stick around through the whole thing. So, hello. Please don't take anything Lauren Southern said seriously. She's a bullshitter. It's up to you to determine what's going to make you happy in your own life, not anyone else. Please don't make life decisions based on a list of statistical likelihoods. Incorrect statistical likelihoods at that. You know, you don't want to end up as some sort of robot thinking, well, I can't have sex with one extra person because then my possible future marriage will have a 4% greater chance of ending in divorce or whatever. I mean, if that's how you live your life, you'll never be happy regardless of whether you get married or not. So live your own life and make your own decisions. That's my advice for you today.